All right, good morning, everybody. For those of you I didn't get a chance to meet yet, thank you for joining me today. So today we're gonna to talk about sustainable acquisition and what it means to you and what you do. Um, hopefully it will mean something to all of you. We are going to zoom through the various legal requirements and what the programs are. There's another session that'll, that'll go a little bit more in depth to what the programs are. I wanna spend the bulk of my time today um, talking about how we integrate this actually into our acquisition. So into the acquisition process and then in some details and, and some thoughts for you on what to do. And if we have time at the end, I will also do a brief demo of our green procurement compilation tool. However, I will be in the GSA booth quite a bit today and if anyone wants to see a live demo of the tool and play with it a little bit, I'll be there so that we can do that. Okay. So first thing we're gonna quickly go through um, just so we're all on the same page in terms of what we mean by sustainable acquisition or what is green purchasing. First thing to keep in mind is the terms are used synonymously. So some of you may be familiar that for years and years, actually it's 30 years now, we've been calling this green purchasing in the federal government. In this administration, we've been calling it sustainable acquisition. We are using the term synonymously. And what we're talking about is buying products with certain specified environmental attributes. But it also means looking at certain services because a lot of the things that we buy products are supplied or used as part of the services that are being provided to us. So we're talking about not just products, but services as well. Um, and one point to make right here, and I'll, I'll come back to multiple times, is the sustainable acquisition requirements apply across the board regardless of the size of the acquisition. None of the statutes, none of the executive orders, and nowhere in the FAR will you see an exception based on the size. So whether we're doing a purchase order or a credit card purchase, we're doing a simplified acquisition, we're doing a large full-blown acquisition, you're buying against our schedules, you're setting up a BPA, whatever, green purchasing requirements apply. So why? Why are we doing this in the federal community? Well. No matter what our mission is, and just in this room, we have diverse missions, we have, all of the agencies have four things in common. We all buy goods and services, we all work in buildings, we all buy or lease fleet vehicles, and we all use IT equipment. And those four things, goods and services, facilities, fleet, and IT, all have a significant energy and environmental impact. And so what we've been doing for the last 30 years is trying to reduce that impact. And purchasing plays a very key role because the decisions that we make influence what those impacts are gonna be. And then more recently in this administration, we've been focusing very much on greenhouse gases and reducing our greenhouse gas impact. And those of you from the military know that it has been policy within the military to be more sustainable because that's a threat to our war fighters. Um, what if we lose our supply chains? Where have a lot of our, our men and women been killed or injured? It's in that supply chain. Just think about moving fuel. My colleague in DOD has a slide um, from Afghanistan of a long fuel line that is just running from point A to point B and everyone in that fuel line is very, very vulnerable. So for the military, this has been a particularly significant issue. Now, we don't have one Uber statute um, in the United States, unlike some other countries. So over the years, we've had a variety of statutes that have set up the different parts of the program, and they've had various goals. Um, but what they come down to is creating markets, creating jobs, making our workplace safer, making our surrounding communities safer, and as I, I noted before, reducing our greenhouse gas emissions. So when I talk about community, what am I talking about? I come from DC, um, our, our huge estuary and, and gem there is the Chesapeake Bay. It is an endangered estuary because of what's being poured down our drains, what's uh, ending up in our rivers that are feeding into the estuary. So years ago, in the DC area, we, we switched over cleaning all of our federal buildings with green cleaning products. That means we're putting less toxic and hazardous chemicals down the drain that ends up in the bay. 
We have lots of people who use the bay for boating, who use the bay for fishing, for swimming, etc. So that makes it safer for the seafood that they're collecting from there, but it makes it safer for them if they want to go swimming there. So that's what I mean by, by local communities. And there's a lot that we do in the federal community that makes where we all live just safer. And that's part of what we're doing here. A word on best value. Um, one of the, the common myths is that when we buy green, it's always going to cost us more. That myth has haunted us for 30 years, and it is just not true. A lot of these products cost the same as the competing non-green products. Some even cost less than the competing non-green products, and some on an initial cost basis do cost more, but they may be the best value to us when we look on a life cycle basis. And so policy that's been laid out, sometimes in the statutes, definitely in the executive orders, definitely in policy that's come from the Office of Federal Procurement Policy, says let's look at this on a life cycle basis. And as a result, you know, is this product better for us when we look at operation and maintenance and when we look at end of life. I've, I've kind of called this the, the color of money. So my pot of money buys the product. One of your pot of money, maybe, maybe operation and maintenance, somebody else's is end of life. All three pots of money belong to our agency, but that's not what we're rated on. What we're rated on is our pot of money, right? So what do I do with my acquisition dollars? What does somebody else do with their operation and maintenance dollars? What does somebody else do with the dollars that deal with end of life? But in fact, if we look at all of those at what they are, the money that belongs to our agency, and we look across that life cycle, there definitely are opportunities to reduce O&M costs and to reduce end of life costs. And so that's part of what we're looking at when we're looking at best value when we're talking about green products. Not any different, many of you are, are from different parts of the military, not any different from what you do otherwise in best value. This slide, just for reference, if you need it, lays out all the different statutes that create the different parts of the program. And you can see that there's quite a few of them. They go back as much as 30 years with the one at the bottom, the Resource Conservation and Recovery Act. So we've been at this a long time. The current executive order is 13693. So some of you may be familiar with some of the older orders, 13423 or 13514, the first coming from President Bush, the second being the first sustainability executive order from President Obama. Those now have been revoked. They were replaced by 13693, which was issued a little over a year ago, and that's our current sustainability executive order. So one question to ask is, well, why now? Why this late in administration should we issue a new sustainability executive order, especially when we already have one? And the reason's pretty simple. Many of the statutory and prior executive order goals expired in 2015. So the executive office of the president had a choice. We can either say to the agencies, those of you who have already achieved the 2015 goals, just keep on doing what you're doing. Those of you who haven't quite made it yet, we still want you to achieve those 2015 goals, and, and we would simply do that through the end of the administration. But our big push in this administration, as, I, as I've mentioned, is to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. And so we had an opportunity to build on the work that we have already been doing to make our buildings more sustainable and to make our fleets more sustainable and to continue that work. And so what this executive order does is to set a new overarching goal looking over the next decade that in the federal community, we're going to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions to 40% from a 2008 baseline. And that means we're going to continue what we've been doing to make our buildings and our fleets in particular more energy efficient and more sustainable, but it does also line up with a lot of the other products that we've traditionally been buying in the green purchasing program. Now, a couple of things that have changed with this executive order, those of you who are familiar, particularly with EO 13514, know that it set a goal that 95% of our applicable contract actions would include green product requirements. You don't see 95% in this executive order. Instead, we've gone back to the statutory goals, which say that when you are buying something that had been designated in any of the environmental programs, 100% of what we buy is supposed to be green unless 
we meet one of the exceptions, performance, availability, and price. And again, with price, it's looking on that life cycle cost basis, not just on the initial cost. So we've gone back to 100%, and that means we are trying to maximize our buying of these products. Second, if any of you buy IT, um, you may be familiar with we've had a goal going back to the Bush administration that when we are buying IT hardware that is covered by the Electronic Product Environmental Assessment Tool or EPEAT registry, 95% of the products we buy are supposed to be EPEAT registered. Well, you don't see EPEAT in the new executive order. Instead, um, they have substituted the term environmentally sustainable electronic products. But the reality is this is still what we're doing in the federal government. So we are continuing to buy the EP registered products. Third, very significant change is sustainable acquisition is now grouped into the three groupings that you see here. So first thing is we have the statutory programs that we've been doing, you know, for up to 30 years. Recycled content, Energy Star and Federal Energy Management Program designated products, and um, bio-based products. Second are some EPA programs. Some of them we've been doing all along. So we've been buying alternatives to ozone depleting products, which is what the SNAP program is. We have been buying water efficient products, which is what WaterSense is. We have been buying cleaner chemicals. That's what Safer Choice is. That used to be known as Design for the Environment, but about a year ago they changed the name, so it's now Safer Choice. And some of us, if we've been involved in freight, have been looking to use Smartway partners because they are more energy efficient, they're reducing their air pollution, and they're reducing their greenhouse gases. So some of this we've already been doing, but the, the, the key new one is the third category, which is the third party standards and labels. Now some of us have been doing this, Already, we've been using Green Seal labels or SCS um, labels for products. We've been using Underwriters Lab. We may be buying Green Guard if we're trying to reduce our, our volatile organic compounds. Um, any of you who are involved in buildings, we're building our, our buildings to the US Green Building Council's leadership in energy and environmental design, and a couple of us are using Green Globe, which is a, a competing system. So those are things we've been doing, but now this, the executive order is specifically saying, take a look at it in EPA, provide guidance to the agencies on what that means, and we will come back to that. One other thing um, I want to point out is there has been a statutory requirement for several years that was included in the executive order that the agencies now have to set targets for the number of their contracts that will have bio-based requirements and they have to set a dollar value on the amount that we're gonna spend on bio-based products. Now, that's being said at the headquarters level, but it could affect, you know, work its way down and affect all of you because we're looking at what are you buying? And DOD in particular has had a very aggressive program to test out and use bio-based products, particularly in the lubes and oils and greases area and to a certain extent in the cleaning products area. So again, this may work its way down to you, so I just wanted to make you aware that these are things that we have to do um, and we're gonna have to report back to OMB on how we're doing, which means we're gonna be collecting up data from the field, working its way up um, to, to our agencies and, and ultimately being reported as part of our semi-annual OMB scorecards. Okay, one other new thing, and this is big new for the federal government, is the top seven purchasing agencies starting this year have to have a procurement plan in which we identify five acquisitions that, go, that are gonna be awarded in FY17 in which we are gonna include supply chain greenhouse gas management. And those seven agencies are, not surprisingly, Defense, NASA, Homeland Security, Health and Human Services, VA, GSA, Energy, and EPA, who's doing this on a voluntary basis. And again, this is gonna happen at the headquarters level, but we're looking out across all of our, our regions to see what kinds of acquisitions do you have coming, and are those among the ones that we are gonna select? 
So I can tell you from GSA's perspective, and we've been piloting this, most of what we've been looking at has been at the headquarters level, but not always. So again, if you start hearing about this, or they're coming down to the field, where Army, for example, is saying, what do you have coming in 17, or what are you planning on for 18 that we may want to include in this? this? This is just to give you a heads up that this is coming. What we're trying to do is not so much look at the greenhouse gases associated with the products or services that are being supplied to us, because there aren't yet good standards for that. So we're looking more at the operations of our contractors. And we are primarily looking at our large contractors, not our small businesses. And we know across several of the sectors that probably 40% of our large businesses already inventory and report their greenhouse gases. Why? Because they are being asked to do this. This has been going on in the commercial marketplace for quite a while. They, they're being asked by their investors. They're being asked by hedge fund managers. They're being asked big time by the insurance industry. Sometimes they are being asked by their clients. Um, to go ahead and publicly report. And there are at least 4,000 companies globally that already do this. Okay, so we as the federal community are following along what is a standard practice. Um, and again, it's to reduce overall our greenhouse gas emissions and some of that is from our supply chain. Okay, now turning to the FAR, these provisions have been in the FAR for a long time. So let me just ask, how many of you have ever opened up part 23 of the FAR? Okay, I'm seeing about four hands go up, five hands. That's pretty normal, even when I have done training for EPA's acquisition office. Maybe half a dozen hands went up. Um, so not unusual. You're in good company. Um, hopefully more of you will be in good company. But so part 23 of the FAR is where our overall sustainable acquisition policy is. And so you'll see subparts in there for buying recycled and for buying bio-based and for buying alternatives to ozone depleters and, and a big section on, on energy efficiency. But that's not everything that we do. Um, this part of the FAR right now has, actually all the FAR right now has not been revised to reflect the executive order. And so you're gonna see the old language in there that, that lists the categories that were in the previous executive order. So we're in the process of updating it. But again, um, that's the main part of the FAR. But there are lots and lots of other provisions in the FAR. So if you go to part four, it's gonna tell you among other things that we wanna get documents electronic, but if we're not getting them electronically, then we would like them to be printed and copied, double-sided on paper that contains 30% post-consumer recycled content. And the prescription for that FAR clause is in part four. Seven and 11 are gonna deal very specifically about what we do when we do our acquisition planning and describing our needs. Same thing you're gonna see at least snippets in say 36 and 39. In part 12 in commercial items, you're not gonna see a specific reference, but what you will see is a section that says part 12 has to be implemented in compliance with all the other sections of, or in cooperation with all the other sections of the FAR, and one of those is part 23. So that's how we're getting it commercial items. Also keep in mind all the products that we are talking about are commercially available off the shelf items. These are not boutique items that are being made just for us. Alrighty, now we're going to real quickly go through the environmental programs just to introduce you to them because again I want to spend most of my time today on how we green our, our actual contracts. So the an environmental program is um, a program where specific products are designated and guidance is provided, and it could be about recycled content percentages, it could be about what we mean by, an en by energy efficient, what are the alternatives to ozone depleters, et cetera. So the example that I have up here for energy efficiency is the Energy Star Program, or DOE's Federal Energy Management Program, or FEMP, also designates items and says this is what we mean for these products to be energy efficient. So here's the list. It's a pretty big list. Most of these are EPA programs. One, the bio-based is a USDA program. One, um, FEMP, as I mentioned, is a, is a DOE program. 
but all the rest of these, except for EPEAT, are um, EPA programs. EPEAT is actually run by a third party organization. It was started with seed money from EPA, so we always have it on here. Two others that I don't have listed, but keep in mind are out there, are alternative fuel vehicles and alternative fuels um, and buying renewable energy. And again, that, that's been a big push across the federal government. GSA is buying renewables on behalf of the agencies. DOD is actually placing its own renewables across a lot of the installations and or engaged with long-term leasing of, of DOD property where commercial company comes in, builds the solar array or the geothermal or, or the wind farm, and then we get the electricity at a favorable rate and then they sell the rest. So there's a lot of that going on. All right, to quickly go through them. Energy Star is primarily an EPA program. We're looking at the top 25% of energy efficiency. A lot of it is consumer items, things like appliances and our IT hardware. Um, but you also will find in there a number of items that you may buy across your installations. FEMP, similarly, this one's run by DOE. FEMP, again, is the Federal Energy Management Program. They work closely with Energy Star, but they also write guidance for products that are not yet Energy Star. So here you're going to find a lot of things like boilers and chillers and other HVAC equipment. So if you're engaged in facilities, them, in addition to Energy Star, is one of the places that you'll go. WaterSense is a newer EPA program, like Energy Star. It looks at the top 25% energy efficiency. But one thing to note about WaterSense is it's not just products, so it's not just toilets or, or shower heads. They also certify irrigation contractors. So again, depending on where you are, if water efficiency is an issue for you. So I'm thinking, for example, Fort Huachuca. Um, when I used to work for the Federal Environmental Executive and we handed out our awards, Fort Huachuca, because of where it's located, is a very water efficient and water conscious facility. And they're gonna look at things like um, irrigation contractors, if they even do irrigation on their facilities. You're gonna look at, at landscape contractors who are gonna zero scape for you. So WaterSense is one place to help you with that. And again, keep in mind, it's not just products, but the irrigation contractors. BioPreferred, one of our newer programs run by USDA. They designate bio-based products for us to buy. At this point, there's about 100 of them. Um, and they set the recommendations for what the bio-based content should be. And again, as I mentioned, DOD has a big testing program for this. A lot of it is lubes, oils, and greases. Um, you'll also see quite a bit gleaning products in there, but there's other things as well. CPG, this is our oldest program. This is where I started. This is our recycled content program. EPA designated the items. There's about 60 of them, um, and, they, and they cut across various categories. And EPA um, sets the recommended recycled content for these products. SNAP, primarily, again, I think of interest to the Army. These are alternatives to ozone-depleting substances, and we use quite a bit of those. So think about, um, oh, in the, the various tanks. So the Abrams tank, for example, was one of the first where they switched over the, um, the firefighting system to an alternative to Halon because Halon is an ozone depleting substance. So it, it's things like that that we're doing. And it may be, you know, not what you're thinking about, not the fire extinguisher that you have in your building, but opportunities that we can include this in weapons systems as well. Safer Choice, as I mentioned, used to be called Design for the Environment. You'll find a lot of these products if you just walk into your Walmart or your, tar your Target or your Home Depot or your Lowe's, but they're also there for us to buy as, as well. And here, one of the things to think about is if any of you are doing cleaning contracts, to ask our contractors to clean our buildings with, with these types of products. And then Smartway, as I mentioned, is an alternative um, it, it's an, not an alternative, it's an EPA partnership program where they have been working with the trucking industry and the rail industry to reduce their air pollution and to reduce their greenhouse gases. EPEAT, as I mentioned, is a third party program, basically IT hardware, so we're talking laptops, desktops, PCs, TVs, and imaging equipment. And again, we want products that meet the underlying standards and are on the registry. 
and that is still a requirement. And then the last one is called environmentally preferable purchasing. It's an EPA program. And this is where we're looking at those third party standards and labels. So now what do we do? There's more than 400 of those standards and labels out there. Um, some of them are verified. Some of them are self claims. And that makes it hard when you're in the contracting community. What do you ask for? And so EPA, working with GSA and a number of the other agencies, put together guidance on what does it mean for one of these standards to be a good standard. And we're looking at how the standard was developed, how it's maintained, are there certification and verification programs, what's the breadth of the issues that they deal with etc. And you can see that draft guidance at the URL that you see at the bottom there. So you go to the EPA site, epa.gov slash greener products, if you want to see that. But the other thing that you will find there is EPA was directed by the Office of Management and Budget and the Council on Environmental Quality to give us guidance as to what standards we, should we use. And their initial set of guidance was issued last September in the categories that you see here. Basically, they based it on work that already had been done by DOE and by the Public Building Service, um, in which PBS, for example, said, here's the top 10 things that we buy or our contractors buy, and here's what we mean by green. And some of that was using third-party standards and labels, like Green Seal or Underwriters Lab or, or some of the others that are out there. And, and so that's what you see in these categories. Not required, but initial guidance. So how does that work? We've got these required programs, statutory programs, we've got the EPA programs, we have this. While this is not in writing yet, <coughs> excuse me, what OMB basically has said is decide what your performance requirements are. Then first look at the statutory programs and see if there's any statutory requirements that apply. But then also keep in mind whether you want to look broader than just recycled content or bio-based content or energy efficiency. And then look at some of the EPA programs, especially the label programs, and look at these third-party standards and labels. So to give you an example, you're buying cleaning products or you're writing a janitorial contract in which um, the cleaning products will be supplied or used. You could simply stop with bio-based and with recycled content for, say, the replacement paper products they will be giving us. Or you could look broader, broader than that at what is a safer product. And so look at the Safer Choice program or look at the third party standards and labels and say, I want you to use products that are Safer Choice certified or meet these standards and labels. And you can do that. But the key is what is your performance need and start with that. Okay, now, the heart of what we really wanna talk about today is how do we green the acquisition life cycle and how do we green our contracts? So when we look at our acquisition life cycle, there actually are opportunities across the life cycle. So let's start with market research. The first thing is, is anything that you're buying one of those designated green products? So you can go to 11 different EPA, USDA, and DOE programs or in one place, you can go to GSA's Green Procurement Compilation, where we have all of the designated products organized by the way that you buy, so by the categories that you buy. We also have services listed there that could include these products and additional ideas on how to green services. We tell you what the requirements are. We tell you what the applicable FAR provisions are. We tell you other useful information that you could use when buying those products. We'll tell you where to buy them from GSA and also from Ability One. And if DLA would ever give me their list of where they are, I'll put DLA in there as well. We also have sample solicitation and contract language. And if we have time at the end today, I'll show you that. Or again, meet me in the GSA booth and I'll do a live demo for you. All right, so what else? Do any of these third party standards and labels apply and, and do you want to use them? What are some of the other applicable practices in the marketplace? So a very simple one is when you're doing IT, do you have the option to take back? Because otherwise, what are we going to do with those electronics at the end of their useful life? We can donate them through um, 
you know, the, the Computers for Learning program. Well, we can get rid of them through GSA access, but you know, what else can we do? So does someone have a take back program, particularly if we're leasing equipment? What's the, the, the take back and what are they gonna do with it? Another commercial practice has to do with bundling. Are you gonna allow people to do every day, put an order in, or are you gonna put one order in at the end of the week? Save on your admin costs, save on your um, charges if, if you're paying for shipment. So those are standard commercial practices that you can take a look at. We've talked a little bit about environmental impacts, looking at what is operation and maintenance, what is end of life? Is this something that you can recycle at the end of its life? Is this something that is safer for your workers to use? So those are kind of the environmental impacts. And then these lifetime costs. Are you, so if you buy an Energy Star or a Water Sense product, you're already buying something that's gonna use elect, less electricity or less water. That's gonna save your agency money. We talked about, is it recyclable or compostable, or do you have to throw it in a landfill? Is it a hazardous waste? And you're paying more to dispose of it than you would if it was not a hazardous waste. Um, I think, I don't think we have anyone here from Navy, do we? Okay, Navy has its prime program, trying to keep plastics out of the marine environment. So they're gonna be looking for packaging that is non-plastic. So those are the types of things that we'll be looking for that we're gonna try and build in that we can discover through market research. Similar, we build this into our, our acquisition planning. What are we gonna say in the solicitation? What kinds of clauses are we gonna include? Um, should we do, should we favor an offer? So if we're doing landscaping, for example, do we wanna look for the companies who actually know, uh, who mow your grass with a, a mulching mower, who know how to xeriscape, who know how to use native plants, all of which are gonna use less water? Are they using less chemicals? Are they using integrated pest management? Those kinds of things, and are we gonna favor them? Are we gonna build that into our evaluation factors? Um, in the military, you may be aware the weapon systems teams usually include an environmental team, and they are looking for opportunities to make the weapon system more sustainable. So one of my, my favorite examples from when I still work for the Federal Environmental Executive is I, I went to talk to the Marines about buying green, and they were building the expeditionary forced vehicle prototype there, and they told me that part of what they looked at was the coating that goes on the outside of the tanks that protects the, the um, warfighter inside against chemical and biological and possibly radiological coating um, attacks, so CARC. It is what that's called. And normally you put it on with a solvent. What they were trying to do was find an environmentally preferable solvent. It took them 12 tries. On the last try, the, the colonel said, if it doesn't work this time, that's it, we're done, we'll stick with our solvent. The 12th try worked. What are they? They're war fighters. Did, is that part of their mission? They felt it was, because they felt that was more sustainable for their workers or the contractor's workers when applying this, as well as making the tank more sustainable for the warfighter who was gonna be inside. These are the kinds of things that we're looking at during the acquisition planning process. A Couple of things that you may not be aware of, in the FAR, and please write down this section if you're writing, it's 5.207C11. Took me three tries to find it and I know where it is. So 5.207C11, which lays out what's gonna be in the synopses, specifically says, include in the synopses, your environmental considerations. So tell them, you know, we're looking for green products or we're, I don't know, we're looking for a meeting and conference planner who knows how to design to minimize the impact. Say that in the synopses. And the FAR actually tells you to do that, and we all violate that. In part 11, um, specifically 11.002A1 tells us when we're, we're um, specifying what we want, there's a whole list in there of the, the different green product programs that we're supposed to take a look at. So, synopsis and solicitations. Next, the proposal. Let's think about what do we wanna say when we're gonna evaluate the proposal? Are we simply gonna build this into technical requirements and that's just part of the technical requirements that we look at? 
is there something that we want to actually build into the evaluation factors or not? If we're buying products, do we want self-claims or do we want verified claims, in which case we are going to ask, possibly in the instructions to offerers, that this is the documentation that they provide or at what point we want them to document that the products that they're supplying to us actually meets the green requirements? Do we want to weight factors? We don't do this too much in the federal community, but we could. We could give points for environmental considerations. So let's say we are doing an acquisition where we're allocating points and you want to allocate some points because a custodial contractor has a plan for recycling the materials they're collecting in your buildings. Those are, again, things that, that you can keep in mind and plan out um, during the process. Contract award. One thing that, that we want to look at is what are we putting in the contract? At a minimum, it's the clauses. My preference is you do clauses and statement of work, and that is just based on real life experience with contractors, not looking at the clauses. So when I used to work for the Federal Environmental Executive, we were being moved from one building to another, and the, the space was being built out for us. And we went over one day to take a look at it, and the painter was in there. And my boss, who was the first Federal Environmental Executive, said, oh, what kind of paint are you using? Because we had specified environmentally preferable paint. Actually, we had specified green paint, and that was not what the guy was giving us. And he said to my boss, to the political federal environmental executive, well, what I'm giving you is better for the environment. And she put a finger in his chest and said, that's for me to determine, not you. And the guy admitted he had never read his contract. That was a very real life awakener for us that people don't always look at what's in their contract. And so scope of work as well as the clauses, that's, that's my preference. As you know, that's not required, but you, that's what I would encourage you to do. Another thing is um, if you are buying against the schedules, make sure you say something in your task or delivery order. Again, it's assumed very often by agency customers that when they buy from GSA, any product that they buy will meet the green requirements. We do have the clauses in there, but very often in our schedules, we are offering both green and non green products, knowing that the variety of performance needs of our customers mean that sometimes a green product won't meet their needs, so we offer both, so therefore, please specify it. I see too many task and delivery orders coming through that, that don't say it, and then you may or may not get the green product. Then in FPDS, we have two data elements in there where you should be indicating if you are buying a green product. And right now the data fields are for recycle content, um, energy efficiency, which covers both the Energy Star and FEM, bio-based, environmentally preferable, and then lots of mixes of the two. So particularly if you're buying services and you may be buying something that is say, I don't know, both recycled and bio-based, you have the option of doing that. So there's a, a lot of different options in there. This again is somewhere that we all are falling down and then those of us who have to do the semi-annual report to OMB on what we're doing to buy green, we have to come back to you and ask you to manually pull the contract or the task or delivery order and see what you actually did because the data is not good in FPDS. So please take a second or have your, your contract specialist, whoever's filling that out for you, fill those items in and, and fill them in properly. All right, contract admin, so some things to keep in mind is we want to ensure that they actually give us the sustainable products. Um, they, they may or may not, we want to check on that. You obviously, just as, just as you do with anything else that you buy, we want to take a look at what's your appropriate level of monitoring. I mean, maybe you just want to spot check in the beginning or not, or maybe you want to sit down with your contractors and as part of your kickoff meeting, point out to them that you've got the green or sustainable requirements in there and, and you want them to do that. At contract closeout, you can say something in your evaluation in PEEPERS or, or CPARS about um, how they did meeting those just the same as all the other requirements that you are evaluating them on. So those are options for you. Okay, now let's talk about um, the details of, of what you actually can put in 
um, the parts of your solicitation and contract. So in your instruction to offerers, you could specify, as I mentioned, how do they demonstrate to you that they have green products? You know, if something comes in a box that's labeled Energy Star, it may be as simple as that. Sometimes, particularly because we deal with resellers a lot, they may need to get the information from the manufacturer. It may be that simply you are going to a website, the Energy Star website, for example, to see if the particular manufacturer and model that you're buying is one that is allowed to, to, to be certified as, as Energy Star. So there's a variety of things, and you can say that um, in your instructions to offerers. If you decide to use something like a take-back program, your instruction offers may tell them to um, give you a plan for how they're going to do this or, or demonstrate to you that you're doing this. Uh, I mentioned that part four says that we want to do electronic, 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 but if we're not getting electronic again, what we want is paper printed and copied two-sided on 30% post-consumer paper. We can say that in our instructions to the offerers, as well as put the applicable clause in there. Okay, there are a lot of solicitation provisions and contract clauses in part 52 of the FAR. Um, and the prescriptions for the most part are in part 23, as I said, the, the one for recycled um, content paper is in part four. So that's where you'll find the prescriptions. Um, you can, of course, put them in or incorporate them by reference, just as you would any other clause. And then also be aware of whether you've got some agency-specific clauses. So in GSA, we have a specific clause that we add for our vendors who are supplying to um, our multiple, under our multiple award schedules. We have specific clauses for them in terms of what information they feed into GSA Advantage, including using green icons to let our customers know the products that are green. There are clauses like that. There may be some DOD-specific clauses um, that, that you want to pay attention to, or some of your other agencies, HHS, I think may have some specific clauses related to green. I'm not sure who all else is in the room um, who may have some clauses. All right, performance requirements. Now, um, I've mentioned multiple times that this applies not just to products, but to services. The list that you see here was put together by OMB about eight years ago, and they said to the agencies, when you are buying these services, there is an expectation that you will be getting products supplied or used where you should put a green requirement in there. Now, if you look at this, you'll see that more than half of this is building related. So it's construction, operation, and maintenance related, facilities related, but it's also things like meetings and conference services and um, laundry and fleet. And then the one that should be on there that I forgot to put up is, um, they listed as furniture, what they're really talking about is interior design services where the furniture is being specified because again, there's green requirements for furniture as well. So if you buy that, um, or you work with the interior designers, that's up there too. So these are the types of services that at a minimum OMB is looking to see if agencies have incorporated green product requirements. Okay, some other things that you might wanna take a look at um, is reporting. How do we get the data from our contractors? Our data systems are not great. Very often we are asked for widget level data and as you know our systems for the most part do not record widget level data. Some of my colleagues who are in the room know that every quarter I ask them for widget level data on green products because we collect it up and report it in terms of what we're doing in the Federal Acquisition Service. But this is a problem and one easy way to get that data is simply to ask the contractors to report. So in GSA and in some of our strategic sourcing um, blanket purchase agreements, we actually have built reporting in there so we can get data on the green product purchases from our, our contractors, and you can look at that. Other things that you can look at, minimizing travel, that reduces the greenhouse gas impact, but it also minimizes costs to you associated with travel by our contractors. So instead, let's do webinars and conference calls. Another one, take back programs, which we mentioned. We mentioned it in terms of appliances, but you could do take back 
uh, I'm sorry, for IT, but you can do take back for appliances, you can do take back even for furniture, or the packaging that comes in furniture. That was something that DOE um, tried out a number of years ago because you got a lot of plastic and a lot of corrugated that's associated with the packaging. And so why don't we ask them to take it back because some of us don't have big loading docks or a place to put all that. Let them take it back. You can build that into the contract. There's a cost, but you know it may be cheaper than us doing it. So um, facilities maintenance, janitorial, what are they doing about recycling or minimizing the waste that they use on their facilities, et cetera. Another biggie is packaging. So one of the best practices actually came from um, one of the depots a number of years ago. The, I want to say it was Susquehanna. Um, they realized that supplies were being delivered and they were throwing away the packaging and so what they came up with was large durable plastic boxes. Those are sent back and then the contractor fills them up again and sends them and you use them over and over and over again but then the depot did not have that waste to get rid of and they actually won a number of awards for doing that. That's a simple example and that's fairly common. You'll see it particularly in the automotive industry where they're getting parts all the time. They too follow that practice. So that's something that we can do. I mentioned Prime where we're minimizing plastic which is um, a Navy program but there's all kinds of things that we can do that we can take a look at and again by talking to our contractors ahead of time we can find out what those practices are and how we can minimize. Same thing with delivery. Talk to our contractors. One of the things that we did in strategic sourcing in furniture was spend a lot of time talking to our contractors about what types of things add costs. Now, delivery was not necessarily one of them, but in other types of products and services, we can find out, like I, I mentioned to you, if every single day someone's ordering a box of pencils or a, a box of paper, why isn't that all consolidated at the end of the week? One shipment, one bundle, reduce the freight costs, reduce the admin costs. And you can look at that across the range of things. I mean, that's a simple office supplies example. But you can look at that across the range of things that we buy. And it's a way of implementing commercial practices in what we do, but also reducing our costs and the cost to our contractors. So things to, to find out about. And then in the evaluation factors, there are a number of options you know, that we mentioned. You could include environmental standalone. You could build it in to what you do. It could simply be part of the tech proposal. Um, some things that we looked at doing is, let's say you're buying meetings and conference services, and you're doing it with points, and you decide you're going to allocate points to a company who has past performance in putting together sustainable meetings and conferences. So you allocate some points for that, or um, you, you give them somewhere you build in a bonus, or you can look at um, how you're doing your pricing and look at what their bid cost is and then either giving it a discount or adding on to it if they don't implement green practices. These are things that have been tried out in the federal community and again, you can try out and they may be ways that ultimately you end up saving money and buy green at the same time. Is that time? Okay, so if that, Angie, if you will pull up my green procurement compilation slides. And again, if you want to see it live, I will be in the GSA booth quite a bit today and I can do a live demo. But what we're going to do is at least um, take a little look at the green procurement compilation. So this is what the home page looks like. That big green box is um, it, it's a scrolling banner. The first one, it, you can click on where it says learn more and um, that will take you to details about the GPC and what it does. You can search for a product in a number of ways. At the very top, there is a search where you can enter the name of a product and click on search and it will come up. Um, over in, you can't see it, but in the top right hand corner, there is a little magnifying glass that will search the entire sustainable facilities tool site. If you want to know more besides the learn more, there's a like two minute short video where one of my staff introduces the GPC. He's a contracting officer and he talks about how as a contracting officer it has helped him 
to buy green products and services. If you want to know more about those environmental programs that we talked about, the recycled content and the bio-based and what have you, you can go there. And there is a paragraph that, that summarizes what each of those programs is. It, there is a link to the actual EPA, USDA, or DOE site so that you can learn more about that program. And there also is sample language in there if you want to buy products under those programs, how you can insert that language into your solicitation. Okay, now this is an example of what happen, of what you see when you go to that learn about the environmental program. So again, you see it's one paragraph that summarizes what the BioPreferred program is, the link to the solicitation language, and the link to USDA's BioPreferred site. All right, second thing on the scrolling banner that we just started is other useful links. We get ideas from our agency customers all the time on what functionality they would like to see added that would help them out. Very easy for us to do. One of them was other useful links. So we now have a link to the acquisition gateway um, that you heard mentioned in, in the um, plenary this morning. We have a link to other green purchasing training resources that are out there. Some of them are on the DAU and FAI sites and are available for you to make use of, but there is a, an Excel spreadsheet that is maintained by the Sustainable Acquisition Interagency Workgroup, and, and that's what that is. Some best practices, et cetera. Okay, so. One of the things that you will see there is, as you scroll down is what's new. We keep this updated as, and we update this generally quarterly as we add new functionality to the tool. So this is a very easy way for you to find out what's new. So this will tell you, for example, that when EPA came out with those um, third-party standards and labels recommendations last September, we built that into the tool. And this tells you what we did. When the executive order came out, um, we did an annotated version of the executive order for you. This will show you where it is, et cetera. Okay, so the other way that you find products is you go over to the product side and you scroll down. And you can, and if you want services, you scroll down there. Now this is what it looks like as you scroll down products. There are more than 20 categories in there. Again, about half of them are facilities related. Um, construction, maintenance, and operation, but not all of them. And you'll see the category, and you see how it's in blue, and underneath it there's a, a number of products, and that's in blue. Both of those are live links. Those are the way that um, you get there. So here we can click on Office Electronics, and this is what you're going to see. Down the left-hand side is the list of the products that are in that category, and you click on those. So in this case, we click on copiers, and what comes up is what you see on the right. You'll see it tells you what the green requirement is. In this case, it's Energy Star, but it also tells you underneath that that EPA is recommending, as far as third-party standards and labels, that we use EPEAT, and that's why we're going to continue to use EPEAT in the federal community. That little icon that's next to Energy Star there is a link to sample language. So again, if you want to buy Energy Star or EPEAT registered copiers, we give you sample language that you can just copy and paste right into your solicitation. If you see, um, there's a little green eye next to procurement info. Those are all mouse overs. And everywhere that you see one of those green mouse overs and you mouse over it, it tells you what is in that section. So if you don't remember what I said today, the mouse over will tell you that. Over on the right, you'll see it says where to buy. Again, for the most part, those are GSA sources. But um, again, if there's Ability One sources, they will be listed there as well. And it's not just our schedules that we live there, uh, list there, but it'll be things like our strategic sourcing sources as well. At the bottom, you have legal requirements, which is basically the, the subparts within FAR Part 23 that are applicable. Life cycle costing, which is primarily for the electricity using products. It's information that we pulled from the Energy Star and the FEMP sites about how this kind of product saves you money over its life cycle. Guiding principles, that's for anyone who's involved in buildings and has to meet the guiding principles for high performance sustainable buildings. We tell you which of the guiding principles this helps you meet. 
additional guidance, which you'll see with some but not other products. And what, I think I have an example. Let me see. Okay, this is what additional guidance looks like. So in this case, it tells you that there was guidance that was developed on incorporating product take-back language into contracts and leases. And we have that there for you to take a look at. That was guidance that was um, developed by GSA, but then went through a vetting process through the Electronic Stewardship Working Group. We'll tell you that, in this case, there were clauses added for EP. If there's a new Energy Star standard, we'll tell you, oh, this Energy Star standard goes into effect next September. If there are limitations on the scope, we will tell you that. Energy Star, in particular, sometimes limits its applicability to certain sizes. So let's say you were buying, I don't know, refrigerators, and it might tell you it applies to this size appliance, but not this size appliance. And that becomes relevant from when you're buying, um, because there may not be a requirement for what you're buying, and it's good for you and your program folks to know that. So we, we provide that for you. On the services side, similarly, you see the list of the services, and again, the blue is the link that gets you to a service view. What it's gonna give you is a description of what we cover in that service. It is gonna give you some downloadable resources. The first one is the FAR clauses and provisions. The second one is a list of the types of products that you might want to include in that kind of services contract. There is sample language. Um, again, some of it is GSA language, but it is not all from GSA. So here we've got one from GSA and one from Customs and Border Patrol, and we are always looking for additional examples. So if you've got some examples and you want to share them with us, we are more than happy. We pull these for the most part from FedBizOps or some of our colleagues or ones that were given to us by our customers, but we're always looking for more. Then down below you see we've got required green products, optional green practices, and evaluation factors. You just click on those and it gives you different ideas. Here it tells you which of the environmental programs apply to that kind of um, service. Optional green practices are other things that you might want to include when you are buying that. So not just a green product requirement, but other kinds of practices. And these, again, were drawn from best practices across the federal community, guidance that may have come out from the Council on Environmental Quality, guidance that some of your agencies put out. There's some things up here we got from State Department, some things we got from EPA, some things we got from HHS. And again, we're always looking for more and better ideas to put up here. Okay, so, oh, we also have given agencies the opportunity to put up agency-specific requirements. So I mentioned before that Public Building Service has some specific requirements. This, these are their 10 products, and this gives you an idea. Oops, let me back up. So what they did was they said recycle content or green seal certified, and that then is what EPA put into its recommendations. So, okay, so that is my quick and dirty data dump. Now that your heads are spinning, does anybody have questions? <laughs>